Chapter 2 of Ancient and Modern Celebrated Freethinkers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ancient and Modern Celebrated Freethinkers by Charles Bradlaugh. Chapter 2 Lord Bolingbroke. Henry St. John, Lord Bolingbroke, was born in his family seat at Battersea, on the 1st of October, 1672, and died there on November 15, 1751, in his 79th year. He was educated by a clergyman in an unnatural manner, and speedily developed himself accordingly. When he left Oxford, he was one of the handsomest men of the day his majestic figure refined address dazzling wit and classic eloquence made him irresistibly the first gentleman of europe until his twenty-fourth year he was renowned more for the graces of his person and the fascination of his wild exploits rather than possessing a due regard to his rank and abilities his conduct however was completely changed when he became a member of parliament the hopes of his friends were resuscitated when they discovered the aptitude for business the ready eloquence and the sound reasoning of the once wild st john he soon became the hardest worker and the leader of the house of commons the expectations of the nation rose high when night after night he spoke with the vivacity of a poet and the profundity of a veteran statesman on public affairs in 1704 he received the seals as secretary of war, and was mainly instrumental in gaining Marlborough's victories by the activity with which he supplied the English general with munitions of war. On the ascendancy of the Whigs, St. John resigned his office, and retired into privacy for two years, when the Whig administration was destroyed, and St. John reappeared as secretary for foreign affairs his greatest work now was the negotiation of the treaty of utrecht this treaty was signed by st john then lord bolingbroke he being sent to paris as the british plenipotentiary and was hailed by the parisians as a guardian angel to such an extent was this feeling manifested that when he visited the theatres every one rose to welcome him so long as Queen Anne lived, Bolingbroke's influence was paramount, but associated with him was the Earl of Oxford, in opposition to the Whig party, and serious differences had arisen between the rivals. Oxford was dismissed four days before the Queen's death, and Bolingbroke officiated in his place, until Oxford's vacancy was filled, which all expected would be given to himself a stormy debate in the privy council so agitated the queen that it shortened her life and the council recommended the earl of shrewsbury as premier and with him the whigs with the accession of george came the impeachment of bolingbroke by the victorious whigs knowing that it was their intention to sacrifice him to party revenge and that his accusers would likewise act as his judges he wisely withdrew himself to france the pretender held a mimic court at avignon and a debating society at lorraine entitled a parliament he offered bolingbroke the office of secretary of state which was accepted by him and it was only at this time that the emanations of the exiled stuart's cabinet possessed either a solidarity of aim or a definite purpose if louis the fourteenth had lived longer he might have assisted the pretender but with his death expired the hopes of that ill-fated dynasty bolingbroke strove to husband the means which the chevalier's friends had collected but the advice of the duke of ormond was listened to in preference to bolingbroke's the results which bolingbroke foretold proceeding rashly and failing ignominiously both occurred the insurrection broke out and failed no other end could have been anticipated intrigues were fast coiling themselves around the secretary he was openly blamed for the reverses in Scotland, but he was alike careless of their wrath or its issue. One morning Ormond waited upon him with two slips of paper from the pretender, informing him that his services were no longer required. After his dismissal he was impeached by the lackeys of the pretender under seven heads which were widely distributed throughout Europe. There is this anomaly in the life of Bolingbroke, witnessed in no other Englishman. In one year he was the most powerful man in England, Secretary of State, an exile, 
and then in the same year he occupied a similar office to one who aimed at the english throne and was impeached by both parties for several years he occupied himself in france with philosophical pursuits until the year seventeen twenty three when he received a pardon which allowed him to return to england but still his sequestered estates were not returned and this apology for a pardon was negotiated by a bribe of eleven thousand pounds to the german duchess of kendal one of the king's mistresses alexander pope was bolingbroke's constant correspondent pope had won the applause of england by his poems and was then considered the arbiter of genius voltaire occupied a similar position in france since pope first laid the copy of his greatest epic at the feet of bolingbroke and begged of him to correct its errors he had gradually won himself that renown which prosperity has endorsed but what a unity in divergence did those philosophers present the calm moralism of pope his sweet and polished rhyme contrasted with the fiery wit and hissing sarcasm of the frenchman more trenchant than pope's yet wanting his sparkling epigrams the keen discernment of both these men saw in bolingbroke a master and they ranked by his side as twin apostles of a new and living faith it was the penetration of true greatness which discerned in the english peer that sublimity of intellect they possessed themselves without the egotism of an imbecile rival bolingbroke had cherished the ethics of one and restrained the rancor of the other and both men yielded to him whose system they worshipped and this trinity of deists affords the noblest example which can be evoked to prove the harmony of reason amidst the most varied accomplishments although pope's name occurs but seldom in the history of free thought while that of bolingbroke is emblazoned in all its glory and voltaire is enshrined as its only deity yet we must not forget that what is now known as the only collection of st john's works the edition in five volumes by mallet were written for the instruction of pope sent to him in letters discussed and agreed to by him so that the great essayist is as much implicated in them as the author of the dictionary it is said in his society these two illustrious men felt and acknowledged a superior genius and if he had no claim to excellence in poetry the art in which they were so preeminent he surpassed them both in the philosophy they so much admired for ten years after this period he devoted himself to various political writings, which were widely circulated, but we must waive the pleasure at present of analyzing those, and confine our attention to the alliance between Pope and Bolingbroke in the new school of philosophy. Bolingbroke's principal friends were Pope, Swift, Mallet, Wyndham, and Atterbury the first three were most in his confidence in regard to religion and although pope was educated a roman catholic and occasionally conformed to that hierarchy and like voltaire for peace died in it yet the philosophical letters which passed between pope and st john fully established him as a consistent deist an honor to which swift also attained although being a dignitary of the church but if doubts arise on the subject they can easily be dispelled. General Grimoire, in his Essay sur Bolingbroke, said that he was intimate with the widow of Mallet, the poet, who was a lady of much talent and learning, and had lived upon terms of friendship with Bolingbroke, Swift, Pope, and many other distinguished characters of the day, who frequently met at her house the general adds that the lady has been frequently heard to declare that these men were all equally deistical in their sentiments que c'était une société de pure deistes that swift from his clerical character was a little more reserved than the others but he was evidently of the same sentiments at bottom there is a remarkable passage in one of pope's letters to swift which seems rather corroborative of the general's he is inviting Swift to come and visit him. The day is come, he says, which I have often wished, but never thought to see, when every mortal I esteem is of the same sentiments in politics and religion. Dr. Wharton remarks upon this paragraph. At this time, therefore, 1733, he, Pope and Bolingbroke, were of the same sentiment in religion as well as politics. And Pope, 
writing to swift is proof sufficient that bolingbroke swift and himself were united in opinions wherever swift's name is known it is associated with his spleen on account of his not being elevated to the episcopal bench when he was promised a vacancy which was reserved for him but queen anne absolutely refused to confer such a dignity upon the author of gulliver's travels that profound satire upon society and religion and this occurring at a time when his energetic services were so much needed in defence of the government he so assisted by pamphleteering satire and wholesale lampoons mr cook says the earl of nottingham in the debate upon the dissenters bill chiefly founded his objection to the provision that the bishop should have the only power of licensing tutors upon the likelihood there was that a man who was in a fair way for becoming a bishop was hardly suspected of being a christian this pointed allusion to swift passed without comment or reply in a public assembly composed in a great measure of his private friends and associates this seems to intimate that the opinion of his contemporaries was not very strong in favor of swift's religious principles this may suffice to prove the unanimity of sentiment existing among this brilliant coterie one a political churchman another the greatest poet of his age the third the most accomplished statesman of his country although they were united in religious conviction it would have been certain ruin to any of the confederates if the extent of their thoughts had reached the public ear the dean wrote for the present the poet for his age and the peer for the immediate benefit of his friends and a record for the future but they were all agreed that some code of ethics should be promulgated which should embody the positive speculations of bolingbroke with the easy grace of pope the elaborate research of the philosopher with the rhetoric of the poet swift coalesced in this idea but was to a certain extent ignorant of its subsequent history it was not thought prudent to trust mallet and others with the secret for this purpose the essay of man was designed on the principles elaborated by bolingbroke in his private letters to pope it was bolingbroke who drew up the scheme mapped out the arguments and sketched the similes it was pope who embellished its beauties and turned it into rhyme Dr. Wharton, the editor of Pope, also proves this. Lord Bathurst told the doctor that he had read the whole of the essay on man in the handwriting of Bolingbroke, and drawn up in a series of propositions which Pope was to amplify, versify, and to illustrate. If further proofs are required that Bolingbroke was not only a co-partner, but co-adjutor with Pope, it is found in the opening of the poem where the poet uses the plural in speaking of bolingbroke awake my saint john leave all meaner things to low ambition and the pride of kings laugh when we must be candid when you can and vindicate the ways of god to man cook's life of bolingbroke second volume page ninety seven this is sufficient to prove the partnership in the poem, and from the generally acknowledged fact of his connection we have no hesitation in declaring that this poem is the grand epic of deism, and is as much the offspring of Bolingbroke as his own ideas when enunciated by others. There is not a single argument in the essay but what is much more elaborated in the works of Bolingbroke while every positive argument is reduced to a few poetic maxims in the essay we may as well look here for bolingbroke's creed rather than amongst his prose work there is however this difference that in the essay there is laid down an ethical scheme of positivism i e of everything in morals which can be duly tested and nothing more while in the prose writings of Bolingbroke, the negative side of theology is discussed with an amount of erudition which has never been surpassed by any of the great leaders of free thought. The first proposition of the essay is based on a postulate upon which the whole reasoning is built. Overthrow this substratum, and the philosophy of the essay is overturned. Admit it, and its truth is evidence. It is, what can we reason? but from what we know this is equivalent to saying that we can only reason concerning man as a finite part of an infinite existence 
and we can only predicate respecting what comes under the category of positive knowledge we are therefore disabled from speculating in any theories which have for a basis opposition to the collected experience of mankind this was a position laid down by bolingbroke to escape all the historical arguments which some men deduce from alleged miraculous agency in the past or problematical prophecy in the future it likewise shows the untenable nature of all analogy which presumes to trace an hypothetical first cause or personal intelligence to account for a supposed origin of primeval existence by which nature was caused or forms of being first evolved although it may be deemed inconsistent with the philosophy of bolingbroke to admit a god in the same argument as the above we must not forget that in all speculative reasoning there must be an assumption of some kind which ought to be demonstrated by proof or a suitable equivalent in the form of universal consent yet in the case of the god of the essay we look in vain for the attributes with which theists love to clothe their god we can but perceive inexorable necessity in the shape of rigid and unswerving laws collected in one focus by pope and dignified with the name of god so that the difference betwixt a deist of old and an atheist of the modern school is one of mere words they both commence with an assumption the atheist only defining his terms more strictly the subject matter in both instances being the same the only difference being the one deceives himself with a meaningless word the other is speechless on what he cannot comprehend the essay shows a scheme of universal gradation composed of a series of links which are one intertwined within the other every rock being placed in its necessitated position every plant amidst its growth bearing an exoteric similitude to itself every animal from the lowest quadruped to the highest race of man occupying a range of climate adapted to its requirements the essay here is scientifically correct and agrees with the ablest writers on necessity a german philosopher renowned alike for rigid analysis and transcendent abilities as a successful theorist observes when i contemplate all things as a whole i perceive one nature one force when i regard them as individuals many forces which develop themselves according to their inward laws and pass through all the forms of which they are capable and all the objects in nature are but those forces under certain limitations every manifestation of every individual power of nature is determined partly by itself partly by its own preceding manifestations and partly by the manifestations of all other powers of nature with which it is connected but it is connected with all for nature is one connected whole its manifestations are therefore strictly necessary and it is absolutely impossible to be other than as it is in every moment of her duration nature is one connected whole in every moment must every individual be what it is because all others are what they are and a single grain of sand could not be moved from its place without however imperceptibly to us changing something throughout all parts of the immeasurable whole every moment of duration is determined by all past moments and will determine all future moments and even the position of a grain of sand cannot be conceived other than it is without supposing other changes to an indefinite extent let us imagine that grain of sand to be lying some few feet further inland than it actually does then must the storm wind that drove it in from the seashore have been stronger than it actually was then must the preceding state of the atmosphere by which this wind was occasioned and its degree of strength being determined have been different from what it actually was and the preceding changes which gave rise to this particular weather and so on we must suppose a different temperature from that which really existed a different constitution of bodies which influenced that temperature 
how can we know that in such a state of weather we have been supposing in order to carry this grain of sand a few yards further some ancestors of yours might not have perished from hunger cold or heat long before the birth of that son from whom you are descended and thus you might never have been at all and all that you have done and all that you ever hope to do must have been hindered in order that a grain of sand might lie in a different place the whole of the first book is devoted to the necessitated condition of man in relation to the universe in one portion there is a succession of beautiful similes portraying the blissful state we are in instead of being gifted with finer sensibilities or a prescience which would be a curse fix destination of man page eight and nine Pope, although an ardent disciple of Bolingbroke, did not entirely forsake the prejudices of childhood. He still indulged in a bare hope of a future life, which his master with more consistency suppressed, so that when the poet rhymed the propositions of St. John, he pointed them with hope, in an eternal future, for that speculation which was still probability in his day, is now nearly silenced by modern science but we must not confound the ideas of futurity which some of the deists expressed with those of christianity they were as different as the dreams of christ and plato were dissimilar pope hoped for a future life of intellectual enjoyment devoid of evil but the heaven of the gospel is equally as necessary to be counterbalanced by a hell as the existence of a god requires the balancing support of a devil we therefore can sympathize with the description of a heaven the poor indian looked for some safer world in depths of woods embraced some happier island in the watery waste where slaves once more their native land behold nor fiends torment nor christians thirst for gold to be contents his natural desires he asks no angel's wings no seraph's fires but thinks admitted to that equal sky his faithful dog should bear him company pope durst not emphatically deny the future life theory so he attacked it by elaborating a physical instead of a spiritual heaven so heterodox a notion of the indian's future sports is not to be found in theology especially as he pictures the indian sports with his dog here was a double blow aimed at christianity by evolving a positive idea of future pleasures and the promulgation of sentiments anti-christian again he attacks them for unwarrantable speculation in theology when he says in pride in reasoning pride our error lies this is a corollary to the first proposition what can we reason but from what we know the only predicate we can draw from this is the undoubted fact we have no right to profess to hold opinions of that upon which we cannot have any positive proof the last line of the first book has been generally thought open to attack it relates to necessity whatever is is right and is not to be viewed in relation to society as at present constituted but to the physical universe the second book deals with man in relation to himself as an individual the third as a member of society and the last in respect to happiness throughout the whole essay the distinctions arising from nature and instinct are defined and defended with vigor and acuteness both are proved to be equally great in degree in spite of the hints constantly thrown out in reference to godlike reason versus blind instinct we confess our inability to discern the vaunted superiority of the powers of reason over those of its blinder sister we see in the one matchless wisdom profound decision unfailing resource a happy contentment as unfeigned as it is natural on the other hand we see temerity allied with cowardice a man seeking wisdom on a watery plank when every footmark may serve him for a funeral effigy political duplicity arising from his confined generalization of facts a desire to do right but checked by accident and cunning everywhere uneasy always fatal 
if the christian's fables were true we might say that adam and eve were originally in possession of instinct and reason and fell by listening to the promptings of volition instead of the unswerving powers of the brutes and for a hereditary punishment was cursed with a superabundance of reason for with all our intellectual prerogatives we have yet failed to arrive at a definite course of action which should influence our conduct the essay speaking of government by christianity says force first made conquest and that conquest law till superstition taught the tyrant awe she taught the weak to bend the proud to pray to power unseen and mightier far than they she from the rending earth and bursting skies saw gods descend and fiends infernal rise here fixed the dreadful there the blessed abodes here made her devils and weak hope her gods gods partial changeful passionate unjust whose attributes were rage revenge or lust such as the souls of cowards might conceive and formed like tyrants tyrants would believe zeal then not charity became the guide and hell was built in spite and heaven in pride and again for modes of faith let graceless zealots fight his can't be wrong whose life is in the right the essay concludes with an invocation to bolingbroke whom pope styles my guide philosopher and friend such is the conclusion of the most remarkable ethical poem in any language it is the iliad of english deism not a single allusion to christ a future state of existence given only as a faint probability the whole artificial state of society satirized prayer ridiculed and government of every kind denounced which does not bring happiness to the people the first principle laid down is the cornerstone of materialism what can we reason but from what we know which is stated explained and defended with an axiomatic brevity rarely equalled never surpassed with a number of illustrations comprising the chef d'oeuvre of poetic grace and synthical memory combined with arguments as cogent as the examples are perfect it stands alone in its impregnability a pile of literary architecture like the novum organon of bacon the principia of newton or the essay of locke the facades of its noble colonnades are seen extending their wings throughout the whole sweep of history constituting a pantheon of morals where every nation sends its devotees to admire and worship let us now turn to the philosophical works of bolingbroke by the will of bolingbroke he devised this portion of his manuscripts to david mallet the poet for publication the noble lord's choice is open to censure here he knew the character of mallet and could expect little justice from him who should have been his biographer the manuscripts were all prepared for the press long before bolingbroke died in this original state they were addressed to pope when published they appeared as letters or essays addressed to alexander pope esq the political friends of st john wished their suppression fearing that they would injure his reputation by being anti-christian a large bribe was offered by lord cornber if mallet would destroy the works he no doubt thinking more money could be made by their publication issued them to the world in seventeen fifty four but without giving a biography or notes to the books his work being simply correcting the errors of the press true there existed no stipulation that he should write the life of bolingbroke but no one can doubt that such was the intention of the statesman when he bequeathed to him property which realized ten thousand pounds in value every one knows the huge witticism of dr johnson who accused bolingbroke of cowardice under the simile of loading a blunderbuss and then leaving a scotchman half a crown to fire it when he was out of the way when those posthumous works appeared the grand jury of westminster presented them to the judicial authorities as subversive of religion morality and government they were burnt by the common hangman 
with difficulty we give a quotation from bolingbroke's ideas of a future life in volume four page three forty eight he says i do not say that to believe in a future state is to believe in a vulgar error but this i say it cannot be demonstrated by reason it is not in the nature of it capable of demonstration and no one ever returned that irremediable way to give us an assurance of the fact again he speaks personally in reference to himself pope and wollaston whom he had been opposing he alone is happy and he is truly so who can say welcome life whatever it brings welcome death whatever it is if the former we change our state that you or i or even wollaston himself should return to the earth from whence we came to the dirt under our feet or be mingled with the ashes of those herbs and plants from which we drew nutrition whilst we lived does not seem any indignity offered to our nature since it is common to all the animal kind and he who complains of it as such does not seem to have been set by his reasoning faculties so far above them in life as to deserve not to be levelled with them at death we were like them before our birth that is nothing so we shall be on this hypothesis like them too after our death that is nothing what hardship is done us unless it be a hardship that we are not immortal because we wish to be so and flatter ourselves with that expectation if this hypothesis were true which i am far from assuming i should have no reason to complain though having tasted existence i might abhor non-entity since then the first cannot be demonstrated by reason nor the second be reconciled to my inward sentiment let me take refuge in resignation at the last as in every other act of my life let others be solicitous about their future state and frighten or flatter themselves as prejudice imaginative bad health nay a lowering day or a clear sunshine shall inspire them to do let the tranquillity of my mind rest on this immovable rock that my future as well as my present state are ordered by an almighty creator and that they are equally foolish and presumptuous who make imaginary excursions into futurity and who complain of the present lord bolingbroke died in the year seventeen fifty one after a long and painful illness occasioned by the ignorance of a quack while lying on his deathbed he composed a discourse entitled considerations on the state of the nation he died in peace in the knowledge of the truth of the principles he had advocated and with that calm serenity of mind which no one can more fully experience than the honest freethinker he was buried in the church at battersea he was a man of the highest rank of genius far from being immaculate in his youth brave sincere a true friend possessed of rich learning a clear and sparkling style a great wit and the most powerful freethinker of his age. End of chapter 2, Lord Bolingbroke. Recorded for you by Ted DeLorme.